I'm Brian Anderson. I am a senior conference producer at EXL Event, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this free webinar uh, that is made possible through our partnership that we're very proud to have and happy to have with the Avoca Group. Um, wanted to make sure that I mentioned uh, before I introduce our, our speaker, Janice Hall, uh, that uh, we have a few other elements of this partnership uh, on the uh, January 16th, 17th, and 18th. We will uh, uh, continue our partnership with them through uh, the TMF, 7th TMF Summit, which is taking place in Orlando, Florida. Uh, Steve Whitaker, who is also a senior consultant for the Avoca Group, will be co-presenting with Grace Crawford on passing inspections with a risk-based approach. So we hope that you'll join us there. And if I uh, wanted to make sure I mentioned what I will go into more detail later, uh, the Avoca Group also um, We'll have a webinar uh, on December 13th that we hope you'll join. It is a, a, a demo. I'll tell you more about that at the end. Right now, I'm eager to introduce uh, Janice Hall. She is senior consultant with the Avoca Group with over 25 years of experience uh, in the pharmaceutical biotech, CRO, and medical diagnostic companies. Uh, she has extensive experience in R&D sourcing, contracting, supplier alliance management, uh, while she was at Johnson & Johnson Pharmaceuticals. Uh, so, uh, my pleasure here to introduce uh, Janice, and uh, thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So, thanks everyone for joining, and um, I look forward to sharing the Oversight Capability Maturity Model. Uh, just want to give you a fair caution that um, the slide deck, we didn't turn off the timing, so it might advance ahead of me, so I may back us up if it does do that. So let me go ahead and get started. This webinar will address one of the newer Avoca deliverables that can enable organizations to understand their maturity level for successful provider oversight. This understanding can help companies to focus their efforts to improve their oversight capabilities, enabling compliance to increased expectations for ICH E6 R2. Avoca has a rich back up here. Avoca has a rich history in helping organizations to advance sponsor and provider collaboration via leading practices for oversight. Avoca's experience in this space comes from over 17 years of consulting and research services with biopharmaceutical organizations and providers, including seven years of establishing and leading the Avoca Quality Consortium, or AQC. These experiences have offered opportunities for valuable insight to what drives effective oversight of service providers, primarily in the area of GCP. Leveraging this over insight in 2017 with the input of an advisory board, Avoca developed an oversight capability maturity model. This is the first of its kind for the pharmaceutical R&D industry. So this is an overview of what we'll be covering. We'll do a couple of polling questions to get to know you. Then we're going to cover some industry challenges and opportunities. We'll share what is a capability maturity model. We'll share how we developed the oversight capability maturity model and its conceptual foundation. We'll also identify the 10 dimensions that are vital. Pardon me that are vital for successful oversight and review sample descriptions of capabilities at specific levels of maturity. We'll review approaches for organizations to do an assessment so they can determine their own oversight capability maturity levels. So let's start off by asking what type of organization are you currently employed? Are you with a biopharmaceutical company, a contract research organization, a non-CRO provider, an investigator site or site network, consulting organization, or other? So if you can go ahead and respond. And let's take a look at what the audience makeup will be. Okay, it looks like most of the audience is from biopharmaceutical companies with 
some members of the contract research organization industry. So uh, welcome, and uh, we hope this will help you with your oversight capabilities. Let's take another polling question to ask, what is your current role as it relates to oversight of vendors? Is it direct oversight where I have direct responsibility for vendor oversight? Or it could be indirect where you are a manager of people so you have staff that report to you that oversee vendor work. It could be an indirect oversight through an advisory role. Are you an advisor to staff that perform provider oversight? Is it indirect oversight as a support role? You provide support to staff that conduct provider oversight. Or are you not involved in direct or direct provider oversight? So let's take a look and see what the outcome is. Okay, so it looks like we have a bit of a mix, which is actually kind of good. So um, we have people, most of them have direct oversight responsibility uh, with 43% roughly, and about 25% have advisory roles as it relates indirectly to oversight. So that's interesting. Okay, great. Janice, this is Lisa McKay from Avoca. I wanted to just insert a comment. Um, okay. Excel asked that uh, we ask those who have not been able to hear uh, to check their computer's audio. Of course, they can't hear us say this, but um, you know, perhaps we can um, have Excel uh, insert a slide. Um, so, can you put uh, a chat out there? Can you put a chat out there for people so they can see it via chat? Actually, yes, yes, I can put a chat out there. Okay. okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what are the industry challenges and opportunities for oversight? Well, oversight is a top priority for sponsors. Sponsors have absolute responsibility to have documented processes and documented evidence of effective oversight. Avoca has seen that maturity levels for oversight capability varies. The term maturity relates to the degree of formality and optimization of processes, from ad hoc processes to formally defined steps to managed results to active optimization of processes and outcomes. Knowing your maturity level helps you to understand how far your organization is on your journey in developing leading capabilities and performance levels. We find that maturity levels vary across the industry meaning across research, development, post-marketing, across organizations, so across their business units if they are multi-affiliates, and then within organizations across functional areas and other groups. Research data from Avoca indicates that alignment gaps persist between sponsor expectations and CRO delivery. The industry can benefit from a systematic and logical approach to assess oversight capabilities that allow one to advance maturity levels. And this has become even more critical given GCP requirements put forth via the addendum to ICH E6R2, whereby it elevates expectations for sponsor oversight. So let's take a look at what those expectations are. ICH E6R2, expect a more comprehensive holistic oversight program that reflects and encourages risk-based thinking across the board, such as incorporating risk management into supplier selection and oversight. It encourages use of prescriptive risk management plans that define critical activities and data, including tolerance limits, and use of leading practices such as root cause analysis for addressing excursions. ICH expects proactive and proportional risk and opportunity management using pre-planned mitigation and contingency planning along with continuous improvement. ICH expects industry to use data to drive objective risk assessments, and all of these practices need to be effectively implemented and substantiated through documentation. So what is a capability maturity model? We did extensive research across many industries to learn about these models. The capability maturity model is a tool 
an organization can use to assess their capability to accomplish a business critical task or set of tasks. The origin of capability maturity models was from the U.S. Department of Defense Software Engineering Institute. So the model comes out of the field of software development. It is also used as a model to aid in business processes and has been used extensively worldwide in government offices, commerce, and industry. These models have been applied for system engineering and other key activities. But based on our research looking at dozens and dozens of maturity models, this is the first time it has been applied to provider oversight for our industry. So what are the characteristics of a capability maturity model? A capability maturity model involves five aspects. Maturity levels. These are a process maturity continuum where the uppermost level is an ideal state where processes would be systematically managed by a combination of process optimization and continuous improvement. Dimensions or key process areas. These identify a cluster of related activities that, when performed together, achieve a set of goals considered important. Goals. These goals of a key process area summarize the states that must exist for that key process area that have been implemented in an effective and lasting way. The extent to which the goals have been accomplished is an indicator of how much capability the organization has at that maturity level. There are also common features. The five types of common features include practices to implement and institutionalize the key process area, such as commitment to perform, ability to perform, and so forth. And lastly, key practices. The key practices describe the elements of infrastructure and practice that contribute most effectively to the implementation and institutionalization of the area. These may be specific leading practices that are applied, including guides, guidance documents, training materials, tools, templates, etc. So this is an example of a maturity model specifically around its level. And you can see here the associated labels and definitions that are shown. Most commonly, we have seen five levels for maturity models that we researched although we have seen some models with four or three levels of maturity. This is another example of a maturity model. As shown, the levels defined for this model are, look different, and that is a, a freedom you have when you're developing a maturity model. The ones that are provided here are suppressed, enabled all the way across the continuous. This example illustrates an additional characteristic that is to define specific dimensions that are assessed at each level to determine capability maturity for these dimensions. The result is this view that shows a design of a maturity model as a matrix, whereby specific relevant dimensions are highlighted, such as strategy, process, and culture. The primary objective for this team, as you see here, was to build an oversight capability maturity model that can be used in a fit-for-purpose way to link users to multiple sources of industry-leading practices. This was done by leveraging an advisory board from five industry-leading organizations in the biopharma industry, including Amgen, GlaxoSmithKline, Pfizer, Sanofi, and Cyformix. This advisory board had 10 members and extended members. And our objective was to empower organizations and individuals to understand their current oversight capabilities and to advance them to reduce risk and drive quality efficiencies and compliance. This image provides a quick glimpse of the high-level model where you can see 10 dimensions in green on the left that are key drivers for successful and effective oversight. We will drill down shortly, but first I want to share some foundational concepts for the model. So first, the advisory board developed a vision to provide a model that will enable pharma R&D organizations to understand current maturity and paths to advance their provider oversight capabilities. And why was this important to the advisory board? We wanted to drive greater efficiency and quality, reduce cycle time and risk, 
and enable fewer findings during audits and regulatory inspections, but we also wanted to support better, more effective partnerships. So how was this developed? We started with extensive Avoca research within and outside the biopharmaceutical industry. As we were doing this, information and documents were collected and shared by AQC member companies to contribute to the research. As we developed the levels, the dimensions, and capability descriptions, input was provided from the advisory board. Once the high-level model was drafted, there was extensive peer review by Avoca and the advisory board with two rounds of review. So the first critical element of the conceptual foundation was to define the levels. We went through many iterations and considerations, proposing, accepting, and rejecting options. Our final defined levels can be seen here, and they range from initial, which is occurring at the beginning, to enabled, which is making a system operational, to consistent, where things are uniform and undeviating, to predictable, where it's able to be foreseen based on previous knowledge, and you can change one or more variables and be able to predict the impact, and then innovative, able to effectively devise and use new, original, creative methods and ideas. Within the conceptual foundation, the advisory board extensively discussed key assumptions and boundaries for the model as is shown here. We decided that oversight specifically refers to the oversight of providers and not the internal staff. That is the whole intent of this model. The model is written in a very general way. We did that deliberately so it could be used for regulated and non-regulated provider engagement. Capabilities can be applied at a tactical or strategic level. An organization can be simultaneously at different levels for each dimension. So for example, you could be at a level two for one dimension while also being at a level four for another dimension of oversight. To advance, an organization must have mastered the lower level capabilities. While achieving a level five might be an ideal state, for an organization it may not be the desired or expect, expected state that they want to achieve. So it's not expected that all companies want to advance to level five for all 10 dimensions. Concepts and tools that are behind the model that you haven't seen yet are at each level. They're provided to support the advancement to higher levels. Application of the capabilities, concepts, and tools is not a one-size-fits-all, and an organization understands what concepts to apply in a fit-for-purpose way for their various vendor or provider engagements. So I'm going to pause here and see if any questions have come in. Janice, there is one question. Um, it is, is there any specific dimension that is the most important? Uh, well, I can give you my perspective. My personal instincts tell me that it all starts at the top of an organization with oversight strategy, and senior leadership support and commitment. But having said that, I think the decision may vary by company, because if you already have that senior leadership support and commitment, then your focus would move on to where you have lower levels of maturity and want to advance those capabilities. But I do think that uh, success it is important that you have that kind of commitment at the top of an organization. Okay, let me... Uh Take us to the next slide. Okay, so I want to mention that every organization to use this model would start with an, a capability assessment. And why would you do that? You want to determine the desired maturity levels in which you're capable um, for where your targets are. You want to determine your current level. So what level are you currently placed for each of the 10 dimensions? And to consider approaches and leading practices to elevate their level of maturity from current levels to desired levels. We also think it's very important that you conduct periodic reassessments to evaluate your maturity progression to ensure continued commitment 
and to determine priorities for focusing efforts on maturing specific capabilities. So now we're going to take a closer look at the model. So I showed you already the high-level model, where you can see 10 dimensions and five levels. And within each of those levels and dimensions in the matrix, there are 50 detailed descriptions of capabilities at the intersection of those dimensions and levels. So we're going to drill down further. Let's start with the first step at looking at the 10 dimensions of effective oversight. The first dimension is around oversight strategy, as was mentioned earlier in the question. So senior leadership, what is their position on oversight? Is it important to them? Are they sponsoring effective oversight as a priority? That can drive the culture. It can drive behaviors. Are there rewards and recognition around oversight? A second level or second dimension is around governance. And this pertains to things like governance committees, decision making, and management monitoring. Another dimension is oversight leadership. This relates directly to the people that have hands-on responsibility for providing oversight of providers. What is their experience, expertise, competency, training? And what is the organization doing to develop these people? Another dimension is on process oversight. This is around policy, standards, process, and tools. And in here it includes things like, are you developing oversight plans? Do you have provider onboarding? What kinds of materials are you using and processes you have around oversight? Another dimension is around metrics, analytics, and technology. Do you have a metric strategy? Are you measuring what matters? Do you analyze those metrics and monitor and report on them? How frequently do you review them? And what technology supports them? For proactive risk and opportunity management, that's another dimension. And that becomes even more important as it relates to ICH E6R2. How are you identifying risks? How are you assessing them? How are you addressing them? Are you eliminating those risks, mitigating those risks, accepting those risks? This also includes performance and innovation because opportunity management is equally important as well as risk management. For the next level or next dimension, budget sourcing, contractual, and financial oversight. This is also very important, and it also includes oversight of external party selection and qualification. Another dimension is on communication associated with the external service provider oversight. And this includes things like effective modes of communication, lessons learned, issue management, transparency of information. Roles and responsibilities is another dimension. And here we look at core competencies of an organization. And RACI charting, charting who is responsible and accountable for specific activities, whether it's the sponsor, whether it's the provider, whether it's a governance committee. And setting SMART goals within that context. So goals that are specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. And then lastly, technical oversight. This is important, because, and it, it's fairly broad in its uh, this, um, definition. What we mean by this is technical oversight as it might relate to different technical functional areas like biostatistics, medical writing, data management, and monitoring. It could also be technical oversight as it relates to the technology-based systems that are being used, like trial master files. And it could be technical oversight as it relates to external providers that you're using, like central labs and imaging providers. So looking at those 10 dimensions, we're going to drill down further and look at the characteristics of an organization at two levels for several of the dimensions. And we can ask ourselves, how do you know you are here and what does this look like? So let's start with oversight strategy. At a level two or three, what are the characteristics of an organization operating at those levels? At level two, thought leaders and senior level sponsors emerge. There is this individual empowerment to contribute to building oversight capability. There is active sharing to learn and implement what works, and there is success recognition. So how do you know you are here, and what does this look like? Well, you can name your thought leaders pretty readily. 
you can see and name the individuals that are stepping forward to share what has worked for their projects. There is active collection of tips and lessons learned, and they're being shared with others. You would know where to go to get these tips and lessons learned or these tools that seem to be working. You're at a level three. There's senior level alignment across groups and businesses and demonstrated commitment to oversight as a business imperative. Expectations within the organization regarding oversight becomes more prevalent and better understood. Individuals take ownership of oversight responsibilities, and there is a proactive attitude toward developing oversight competencies. And what does this look like? How would you know you are here? There's clear messaging that has been sent out by senior leaders stating that effective provider oversight is a priority not just for functional areas, but across the organization, across R and D, across affiliates if you have a multi-affiliate organization. And those messages may state things like effective provider oversight is critical for the organization to achieve some very specific objectives. Connections are made regarding how oversight can drive or derail successful achievement of specific objectives. And line managers define specific expectations to their staff. Individuals embrace ownership and proactively engage with each other and providers drive effective oversight. So for governance, as a dimension of oversight, what are the characteristics of an organization operating at level two or three? At level two, considerations are being put forth for a formal model of governance. There are discussions and development of proposals for governance, either central or decentralized, in a fit-for-purpose way. Proposals are put forth for decision models for governance and oversight for evaluation by leadership. How do you know you might be here? The organization is evaluating the primary vendors with whom they are partnering for business critical work. The organization is holding strategy sessions with those partners to evaluate options, costs, and benefits of leading practice governance constructs, such as executive steering committees, operational committees, other committees, maybe quality oversight committees. Internal assessment of decision model options are discussed, such as a consultative approach. So are you going to consult with your partner and then make decisions? Or is it an autocratic model where you will make the decisions and expect the provider to move forward? Maybe a, a democratic decision model. Majority would rule in that case. Or a consensus model where it, there will be attempts to get everybody to agree with the same approaches. There are pros and cons to those decision models, and culture fit is important for your organization before you make those kinds of decisions. Here at a level three, there is early establishment of external service provider oversight governing bodies. There are formal oversight management models and approaches for decision making. There is initial central performance monitoring, internal and external. An organization is establishing issue escalation and resolution pathways via governance. So how do you know if you are here? Governance committees are defined with initial development of charters. And within those charters, there's defined membership, mission, the decision model, principles of operation, governance oversight intent and scope, meetings and establishment of leader and provider relationships at an enterprise level and at lower levels, such as across functional areas and across support groups. Priorities are being defined and infrastructure for oversight site is being established. So for another dimension, oversight leadership, what are the characteristics of an organization operating at a level one or two? At level one, there's informal, more granular focus of oversight, often associated with technical difficult, uh, delivery. There is a lack of understanding or acceptance of oversight needs and requirements. Rarely is training provided at this level. This level is often characterized by micromanagement, rework, and duplication of effort. Now, how do you know if you are at this level? Well, individuals may or may not understand or prioritize the importance of effective oversight. There's a high degree of variability in what people are doing. If issues arise, study staff may dive in to the issues and mandate prescriptive tasks to firefights. If that happens, providers take a back seat and go through the motions as prescribed. If a provider is not successful, study staff will take an I will do it myself approach. 
In this case, trust suffers and is often blamed and finger pointed. At a level two, oversight competency skill and skills are emerging and they are being recognized. These skills are being described and shared informally. An organization begins to develop training materials that target multiple dimensions of oversight, such as for metrics or risk management. And there's a reduction in micromanagement. But how do we know if we are at this level? Well, competencies for oversight are being noted by leaders. People who exhibit those competencies are realizing positive results. Coaching of individuals encourages development of those competencies and skills. Staff begins to pull back from the tactical work, viewing provider activities at a higher level, more from an outcomes focus. There is more delegation and reduced micromanagement, and this frees up the providers to be more efficient and nimble. There is development of formal training content on effective practices of oversight, and training content spans many dimensions of oversight. If we look at process oversight as a dimension, what are the characteristics of an organization that might be operating at a level one or two? At level one, there are few or no policies, standards, processes, or tools available to provide direction or oversight requirements. Oversight tends to be informally implemented. There's inadequate documentation of oversight activities and no internal compliance checks. There is inconsistent oversight of processes used by the providers as well. So how do we know if we are at this level? Well, this is an environment where anything can happen. People are making it up as they go along, making decisions based only on their project needs. Providers can get confused due to variability based on different teams and team leaders. Ad hoc rules and expectations are communicated, and these rules and expectations often are not documented and frequently change. If you're at a level two, the need for developing oversight policies is recognized and prioritized. Process owners are assigned to develop oversight standards, processes, and tools. Informal oversight planning begins. There are informal approaches for documentation of oversight. Initial oversight process checks commence, and there is alignment on business needs for oversight of external service provider processes as applied to projects, knowing what SOPs, work instructions are being applied. How do we know if we're at this level? After surprises and negative results, leaders begin to articulate policies. For example, provider bids cannot be sought without a final approved budget. That would make sense. Then you don't have the wild, wild west going on. Those policies are unambiguous, they are clearly stated, and they're documented. Emerging oversight leaders are assigned to outline and offer oversight practices. Oversight planning for CRO and other provider services begins to take shape. And tracking of provider SOPs that are being used on sponsor studies begins. For metrics, analytics, and technology, what are the characteristics of an organization operating at two levels there? So we'll look at level two and three. At level two, business groups identify oversight metrics that may be of value. These oversight metrics are developed, implemented, and reviewed. And metrics analysis provides insight to oversight of external service provider delivery and outcomes. Metrics insight begins to drive decision making. Use of oversight metrics is local to business groups. Ad hoc ESP oversight metrics are shared with providers and there is an expectation for the external service providers to propose solutions. How do we know if we're at this level? Isolated groups identify activity-based metrics. For example, time to final trip report after site initiation. These are collected, enabling transparency to these activities. Metrics drive discussions and decisions with providers, whereby the provider is expected to demonstrate awareness of these activity issues through the metrics and present solutions. If you're at a level three, this is characterized by an initial having an initial oversight metric strategy in place with meaningful and obtainable targets. There is centralized oversight metrics tracking, reporting, and review on a regular basis. 
Data are shared across business groups with improved means for visual, visualization. There's refinement of oversight metrics that begins for better targeting to measure time, cost, and quality and to drive consistency across external service providers. So how will we know if we're here? You'll find that there's a shift of lower level activity-based metrics to more predictive metrics that get compared to preset targets, such as actual number of sites initiated versus plan. Metrics data flows to a centralized vehicle for tracking with regular review cycles. Proposals are put forth to refine metrics to align better across projects to enable visibility to trends, leading to earlier, more proactive decision making in advance of hitting undesirable targets. Now let's look at proactive risk and opportunity management as a dimension. What are the characteristics of an organization at level two and three? At level two, there's awareness of impact of risks to time, cost, and quality. Risks are identified and assessed, yet there's inconsistency in mitigation planning. There is random, inconsistent, and ad hoc sharing of opportunities and innovation approaches to leverage. How do we know if we are here? Individuals are identifying elements of risk that can impact their project, but proactive documentation of risk or development of mitigation plans are not consistently applied. Individuals may struggle to prioritize risks to mitigate, and there is a focus on risk identification, but less focus on avoidance or minimization. There is little focus on potential upside opportunities to leverage. At level three, a risk management approach is prioritized to address time, cost, and quality risk. There is a proactive risk planning program that is defined and implemented. There is training on risk identification, risk assessment, mitigation, and contingency planning. There is a systematic shared lessons learned that proactively leverages learning to better manage risks and opportunities. And how do we know we might be here? Well, this is where tools and guidance are available to support risk management. Training results in greater proactivity to focus on risk prioritization, mitigation, and contingency planning. Better documentation for risk management plans. And via lessons learned, individuals are better equipped to propose mitigation strategies and contingency plans due to other successes that are shared. With better risk management, focus can shift now to some upside opportunity considerations and evaluations. So for budget, sourcing, contractual, and financial oversight as a dimension, what are the characteristics at a level three or four? At level three, financial sourcing and contracting policies and processes are defined. Processes are defined and implemented for ESP selection. The organization follows a consistent due diligence process. Preferred ESPs or external service providers are identified. Master service agreements are being executed. Processes are defined and implemented for contractual oversight and financial management of budget, invoicing, and payments. How do we know we're at level three? Policies are clearly stated and documented with required training. More accurate budgeting enables smoother budget approval processes. Providers are pre-qualified in a systematic way with full documentation that supports substantiation for future health authority inspections. Lists of acceptable providers are shared that enable negotiations for better pricing. There's greater transparency in the RFP process and contractual efficiencies are implemented through the use of master agreements with repeatedly used providers. At level four, preferred or strategic external service providers identify, are identified for critical spend categories. And there's rationalization of the remaining spend. What we mean by that, is you're reducing the number of suppliers you are using for specific services. Well-established embedded due diligence processes in place. Templated contracts result in minimal legal reviews. External service provider relationship management practices are set up for targeted providers. Financial management of outsourcing is streamlined. Improved data-driven financial controls are in place, minimizing change orders. And contractual obligations are tracked enhancing contract oversight. How would you know you are here? Well, strategic partner providers are identified for high risk and high spend service categories. Due to sourcing policies, staff must work 
with these providers or justify going outside the list. Consolidation of spend with fewer providers drives even better pricing and value-add services that are offered. Budget reviews are conducted regularly, both internal for programs and external with providers. Fewer change orders are an outcome. Deliverable and financial reconciliations of contracts occur to create better predictability at the end of the project. And then for technical oversight, what are the characteristics of an organization operating at a level two or three? At level two, there's awareness of interrelated oversight needs that call for depth and breadth of multi-domain technical in insights, such as across functions or across external service provider service types. So how do we know we might be operating at that level? Well, senior leaders and heads of various functions and other groups begin to recognize that all areas play a role in effective oversight and that they are interrelated. These groups and our functional area heads begin to articulate the need for leading oversight practices for their parts of the organization from a technical perspective and evaluate the linkages across these groups. For example, effective oversight of biostatistical service providers is compromised if there isn't effective oversight of the data management service providers. At level three, application of technical oversight knowledge across the spectrum of outsourcing engagements drives consistency. Technical input is provided into oversight tools, guidelines, processes, and templates to refine oversight practices to align with technical requirements for different group needs. So how do we know we're here? Each group or functional area provides input into oversight policies, guidelines, processes, tools to drive transparency of effective oversight across outsourcing engagements. Our oversight practices become aligned to technical needs, such as, for example, creating awareness that effective oversight of an IXRS or IRT provider impacts many functions. It impacts clinical operations for enrollment, biostatistics for randomization, clinical supply groups for drug supply. So the previous slide shared descriptions of two maturity levels across eight of the 10 dimensions. This represents 16 of the 50, 50 descriptions in the entire model. Those descriptions provide insight for an organization, but if we drill down yet further, as shown in this screenshot, we will see the general structure of how, at each level, an organization can identify specific guides, tools, and templates that can be deployed to enable organizations to advance. Shown here is one of the 10 dimensions in this case for governance. In this case, there are tools that direct users to concepts for building governance constructs, including charters, governance plans, decision-making models and processes. Developing these governance constructs is important so it can be applied to the more strategic engagements you have with providers. I'm going to pause here to see if any questions have come in that I might be able to answer. Janice, we do have a question. Um, okay. And the question, the question is, what depth of oversight is needed for technical oversight, and who is considered qualified to provide this? Okay, well, um, for technical oversight, I think it's important to have depth of capability, and that becomes more and more important if you want to move up to higher levels of maturity. So within, say, data management, while the professionals in data management probably know how to do their jobs really well, hands-on, do they really know how to step back and provide oversight and guidance and look at the right kinds of data, metrics, reports, and so forth, that they can help make sure the project is successful without diving down into the detail. So I think it's very important that technical oversight is a priority and that it is treated as specifically oversight, uh, that you're trying not to dive in. But it is important to have that technical knowledge because if you have knowledge of things like a database build, validation of databases, 
go live, database locks, maybe soft locks and hard locks, things like that. That technical knowledge, you need to be able to have that conversation with a provider to share those expectations. So I think that, um, I think that that hopefully will answer the question about how important is that technical oversight that you're conveying those expectations but not doing the work. Okay, great. Any other Thank questions? you. Okay. Um, there was one other question. Um, I can ask it at the end. Uh, it's it's a little bit broader in nature, um, and that was how did the descriptions get developed for each of the 50 cells in the matrix? Do you want to take that now or at the end of the? Yeah, I can take that now because I, um, we just finished reviewing some of those details. Um, so uh, just to give you background on that, the advisory board was very active in developing the foundational concepts for the model. We had many meetings with them. And as part of these discussions, Avoca gained insight into the, these different um, levels the experts felt were, I'll call it, ideal state for each of the dimensions. So what is, you know, an ideal state for governance or for risk management? We use that insight and the experiences and observations we've had in Avoca, and we drafted up all 50 descriptions of the capabilities for all five levels and 10 dimensions. Now, these descriptions were drafts. We, they went through extensive reviews and editing based on feedback by the advisory board. In fact, uh, one of the members took the content and shared it internally with a larger team outside of the advisory board, which was helpful to get this broader input. And we incorporated this input from the advisory board and other sources on two separate occasions and then put the model back through another internal review within Avoca before finalizing. So. Hopefully that illustrates how we went about developing those descriptions. Okay, thank you. And that's all for now. Okay. So a critical first step to do an organizational assessment of these 10 oversight capability dimensions uh, was to develop um, the details behind each of the dimensions. Now, what I'd like to do is a couple of polling questions to look at the first five and then at the second five dimensions to see where we may have lower levels of maturity as an industry, knowing this is only reflecting this audience. Uh, this may give us insight to where we might want to focus initial efforts as an industry to advance maturity capability. So let's go to those questions. And the first question is of the five following dimensions of oversight, which one is the most challenging for your organization? Is it around oversight strategy from your senior leadership, their sponsorship, culture, behaviors, and rewards and recognition? Is it around governance, the organizational construct, committees, decision making, and management monitoring? Is it around oversight leadership? This is the hands-on, uh, people who have hands-on responsibility, what are their competencies and expertise? Is it process oversight, like policy, standards, process, and tools? Or is it metrics related? Do you have the metrics uh, defined, and are you measuring and analyzing them? So let's go ahead and take a look at the responses that we're getting. Okay, so it looks like we're saying it's rather mixed, quite mixed. So what I see is metrics seems to be the largest challenge based on this audience, but we also have a pretty high percentage of challenge as it relates to process oversight and oversight strategy. So it looks like probably because this is such a blended mix, it tells me that we really have a lot of areas to work on, and it may vary by company. So let's take a look at the next five. So the next five dimensions of oversight, which one is the most challenging for you? Is it around proactive risk and opportunity management? Is it around budget sourcing and contractual and financial oversight? Is it around communication associated with your external service provider oversight, including issue management? Is it around roles and responsibilities, understanding your core competencies and racy charting? And is it around, or is it around technical oversight, making sure that people at the technical level are applying that to the oversight. 
So let me take a look at the feedback we're getting. Okay, so it looks like, again, a bit of a mix. This is interesting. All right, so the highest challenge right now of that set of five is around proactive risk and opportunity management. And I could venture to say that seems to be, in our observations at Evoca, a very important area because of ICH E6R2 and the expectation that risk-based approaches be used for a lot of different activities for conducting clinical trials. Looks like we've got budget sourcing and contractual oversight fairly well nailed, so that's very good. You wouldn't have to focus there. But we also have some challenges around probably roles and responsibilities, understanding core competencies, as well as communication and so forth. So it is a mix, and I, I guess I'm not surprised because I do think that um, all of these areas are very important. And we may have, as I said earlier, varying levels at the same time. You may be at a level two on one dimension and perhaps a level four on another dimension. So it could be quite a mix in the industry. So I mentioned earlier that it's important for you to think about how you might do your own organizational capability assessment for your maturity level. So the advisory board discussed approaches for conducting those capability assessments, and we're sharing three options here with the associated pros and cons. So a first approach to consider is internal self-assessment. This is where you would use your own internal resources that are closest to the oversight practices, processes, and tools. These are the people that do it. Now, the pro here is that would be a pretty fast cycle time, a low resource requirement, and low cost. And there'd be little to no learning curve for these people who are doing the assessments because they know what's being done. They know the tools that are being used. They know the processes, the policies in place. However, there is a con here that there is potential for bias, or at least an appearance of bias, that when you're doing the assessment through this approach, that it may be that the levels are being reported at higher than what might really be going on. Another approach would be to use internal resources that are unaffiliated to oversight, such as QA auditors that are in the organization. And they're not directly performing oversight practices, but they may have some level of awareness what's going on. This would probably be a more moderate cycle time and minimal resource requirements and lower cost. Um, it also can avoid that potential for bias or the appearance of bias in the assessment. But the cons are that there may be some learning curve for that assessor if they are not directly performing oversight practices because their expertise is in QA. And then third, you could use an external party to perform an assessment. The use of an external, external organization or individual that has industry knowledge, especially around oversight, but it, it, they're likely not going to have organizational knowledge for your specific organization. One of the pros for this is really the, having a very independent review with the least probability or potential for bias and, or appearance of bias. The con, though, is it may be a higher learning curve for the assessor to learn the oversight practices. They would probably go in and do kind of a, an assessment, interviews, questionnaires, and a gap analysis between where they are and where they might want to be. Um, this may be a higher cost and take a, long, a little bit longer time, cycle time-wise, but um, you might get that pro of a more independent review. So the question is, how will you leverage this model to understand your capability maturity levels within your organization? So I'd like to thank everybody for your time and attention and see if there are any other questions. Janice, there are a few other questions. Um, okay. How would you approach slash implement this oversight capability model in the context or within a QMS? Uh, in the context of QMS, okay. Well, actually, interestingly enough, we are being asked, the book is being asked to do that. We're doing the assessment of 
uh, different organizations' quality management systems, uh, particularly in alignment to ICAG 6R2, and have been asked to also take a look at their oversight capabilities. And so um, the approach we're taking with this uh, currently is through extensive interviews and document review. And so that, that is the approach we're taking right now. We're also developing a diagnostic tool that it can be used as a survey to ask a broad range of questions across a broad audience to test where an organization might be for all 50 of these different cells to say, and the 10 different dimensions to see where they are. So um, the way to implement within your own organization, if you wanted to do this, um, it may be a big task to think of it across an entire enterprise. And so uh, in talking with the advisory board, we talked about what, how people might launch this, get going on this. And we thought it would make sense for certain functional area heads that feel that this is very important to their organization and to improve their um, outcomes for them to do an assessment just within the walls of their functional area to see what tools they're using, the oversight that they're um, uh, actually implementing, the metrics they're using, the risk-based tools that they're using, and then using that to determine where they are as a function. And then you can use that to leverage for other functional areas to say this is what we learned, this is how we approached it. And so um, and this is where we're going with our plans to, to uh, um, advance on our maturity level. Uh, other questions? There is another one. Um, and the question is, does ICHE6R2 apply to post-authorization safety studies as many are conducted at the academic sites which do not have the transparency of typical vendors. So is ICH applying to post-marketing? Did you say post-marketing? Yeah, post-authorization safety studies. Yep. Okay, post-authorization safety studies or past studies. Um, I don't want to profess that I am an expert on that, and I think that might be something I'd be safer to say. I'll get back to you on it. I'll give you my initial thinking, but I would like to have an opportunity to kind of verify that. Uh, when you're talking post-marketing, then um, I guess we have to ask, is GCP applying? And uh, if we talk to regulatory and QA, if they feel that GCP does not apply in those settings, then the ICH E6R2 recommendations, while they probably are good and it would be good to apply them, it may not be required that they be applied. So that would be my kind of qualified question, but I'd want to actually seek some more advice on getting a, something more definitive for that. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, I see another one has come in. Um, let's see, how would you manage cultural diversity and geographical differences? Hmm. Well, you know, we haven't faced that yet, and um, when we say cultural diversity and geographic differences, um, I'm going to assume that your organization has what I would call global SOPs and global requirements. But if those things are localized, so if you have affiliates that are, you know, U.S. and Europe and so forth, if they have different policies and processes then, and tools that they use, then those assessments will probably be, need to be fairly independent. Um, and the levels may vary for an affiliate that may be, you know, not at home by the mother ship, so to speak. So I imagine that that could create some challenges. However, it might also drive an organization to prioritize alignment of oversight across those different cultures and different geographies. Any other okay. questions? 
we're at the top of the hour, so I don't know if we're going to be able to stay. I see that a couple more have come in, and uh, we do are able to see the individuals who asked the question. So we can get back to you and uh, provide you with our, our answer. Okay. That would be fine. And, and so, Brian, lastly, will you be covering? Go ahead. Yeah. And, and lastly, we will address these questions to the entire audience um, so that they will also have the benefit of, of the answers uh, that were were uh, questioned or were asked during this session. Okay, great. We also want to remind you of upcoming webinars that are coming on Monday. There is an, another Excel and Avoca partnered uh, webinar on clinical measuring clinical quality with effective metrics. And on the 13th is an inside look at the Avoca Quality Consortium Knowledge Center, if you have an interest in seeing that. And there's also some Excel events where Avoca will be speaking at the Trial Master File Summit in January, as well as the Crown Conference in January. And I would just add, this is Brian coming in again, that if you uh, are interested in the Trial Master File Summit, uh, do note that there is a uh, by participating in this webinar, you will receive a 15% discount registration when you use code C945Webinar. That's C945Webinar for the Trial Master File Summit. That's happening January 15th to the 18th in Orlando, Florida. So it's a good time of year to catch some sun as well as to network with the over 250 TMF professionals and 50 plus speakers. And we're very proud to uh, say that uh, the Avoca group, uh, Steve Whitaker, will be among them. I want to thank everybody for participating. Unless there are a few, uh, any other comments, Janice, before we go, I will uh, give you uh, a good week. Uh, I will be back here virtually, hopefully, uh, with you on December 11th and 13th for those webinars of Avoca next week, and I look forward to seeing you if not at uh, Crown, certainly at PMS in January. Thank you. Have a good rest of your day. Thank you.